I'm uh, delighted to introduce our speaker today, um, David Oshinsky, who is the director of the Division of Medical Humanities at NYU Langone Health and a professor in the NYU Department of History. He graduated from Cornell University and received his PhD from Brandeis University and has written many acclaimed books, um, including A Conspiracy So Immense, The World of Joe McCarthy, which was a New York Times notable book of the year, Worse Than Slavery, which won the Robert Kennedy Prize for its distinguished contribution to human rights, and then two um, that are more medically focused, Polio, an American Story, which was awarded the Pulitzer Prize uh, in history. And then um, for those of us who work in our safety net hospital, Grady, he wrote on Bellevue, Three Centuries of Medicine and Mayhem at America's Most Storied Hospital, which was an NPR Best Book of the Year and won the New York Library Society Best Book about New York City in 2017. Professor Oshinsky has received the Dean's Medal from the Bloomberg Johns Hopkins School of Public Health for his distinguished contributions to the field. And Bill Gates wrote that Oshinsky's polio book influenced the decision that Melinda and I made to make polio eradication the top priority of our foundation, as well as my own personal priority. I'll say that um, I first heard uh, uh, Professor Oshinsky speak um, years ago before I came to Emory um, about uh, when he was uh, shortly after writing uh, the book on polio. And I found it a completely mesmerizing talk that has always stayed with me. And as we have started to navigate um, COVID, uh, it, um, I, it, frequently I have thought back about that talk and about um, uh, another time in America where there was a pandemic and a wait for a vaccine. And I thought he would be uniquely um, uh, appropriate to uh, give us some reflections from history on what we are seeing now. And so I'm so pleased to welcome you, uh, Professor Oshinsky, to um, Emory uh, Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, and thank you so much for joining us and I look forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much, Wendy. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I do remember that just after the polio book came out, I gave a talk to the CDC. It may have been one of the first talks I gave in Atlanta. So it's great to be back. Uh, many, many years later. Um, very, very briefly, uh, I would like to talk to you about my own recollections of polio, and then we'll just sort of move forward if we can. Uh, I am old enough to remember what life was like before the vaccines of Salk and Sabin, and polio would come every summer like a plague. It would sort of begin in late May around Memorial Day and then pick up speed. And what I remember very well was that the New York newspapers actually kept box scores of uh, young children in polio wards in public hospitals. And you see the numbers <clears throat> really begin to rise heavily in June, even higher in July, way up in August. And then they'd start to peak and come down. And what I remember during those summers, as many of you do as well, is the, the, the tremendous fear that my parents had. This was a disease that um, basically there was no protection, there was no cure. Every kid was equally vulnerable to this. Um, I remember my parents every week or so would give me a polio test at home. Could I touch my toes? Could I put my chin to my chest? We weren't allowed to go to the movies or be in crowds. They generally closed the beaches and the swimming pools because the belief was that polio traveled through the water. And I would remember coming back to school in September and you would see kids in wheelchairs, uh, kids on crutches, You'd see photographs, those, often iron, those awful iron lung photographs of kids wall to wall in polio wards in, inside what looked like torpedoes that were breathing for them. And then <clears throat> when you'd come back to school, you'd see the occasional empty desk, uh, meaning that the child had not made it through polio summer. Then there'd be relief uh, and then it would start all over again the next spring. And therefore, when the polio vaccine, <clears throat> excuse me, the first polio vaccine finally was developed and tested, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, there was absolute euphoria in the country. And by that, I mean that um, when we got word that the Salk vaccine was safe and potent and effective, 
um, a huge national celebration occurred. Uh, factory whistles told, uh, blue uh, church bells told, kids were let out of school, people were hugging in the street. Uh, President Eisenhower invited Jonas Salk to the White House where for the first time in anyone's memory, uh, Ike broke down in tears as he thanked Jonas Salk for saving the children of the world. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was just an absolutely extraordinary memory. What I'd like to do now is to take you very, very briefly in the 20th century, <clears throat> excuse me, from uh, basically the early part and the first really famous case, Supreme Court case involving uh, emergency medicine and then go right forward. So if we could start Kimberly with the first and then the second slide. <clears throat> this is the, the case of Jacobson versus Massachusetts. Many of you may have heard of it. It involved uh, a series of smallpox outbreaks in towns throughout Massachusetts. And what the state legislature did was to allow towns to mandate vaccination. And they would do it in the way we've done it since, you know, no one will come into your home and, and hold you down and give you a vaccine. But what you will have to do is to pay a penalty for not taking one. In this case, it was a minister named Henning Jacobson. He said the vaccine was dangerous and it went against God's will to put it into his body. He was not going to take it or give it to one of his children. And he was not going to pay the $5 fine that went along with refusal. That was the punishment. The case went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the court in a really remarkable decision written by Justice Harlan said, quote, the constitution of the United States does not import an absolute right in each person to be at all times and in all circumstances wholly free from restraint. There are manifold restraints to which every person is necessarily subject for the common good. In other words, what Harlan was saying is that the public health of the larger community trumps the individual freedoms of people who are not basically or are refusing to do something which is for the common good. Now what Harlan did say, which is often ignored in the opinion, was that there really had to be a public health emergency and that if possible, there should be ways as exemptions that people who could not medically take a vaccine without receiving some sort of negative medical outcome <clears throat> could be exempt. That has generally been ignored. And basically what we do talk about in Harlan's decision is the importance of protecting the rights and the public health of the larger community. And we expected, a number of us expected, and it was written about quite frequently, that in the case just decided by the Supreme Court, um, that they would use Harlan's opinion, but they did not. And we will see what the future holds in terms of vaccine mandates, including mandates for <clears throat> kids going to elementary school for undergraduates at uh, Emory, uh, and, um, and whether a vaccine can be mandata mandated for them. Uh, as of now, it looks like employers can do that, but we are now not really talking about employers, we're talking about sort of students entering an educational environment. I think all of this will be up for grabs. Next slide, please. This of course is the famous influenza of 1918, 1919. And basically is talking about quarantine and the 
penalty for violation. Now we know in this pandemic that more people died in a shorter period of time than any time in human history. We know that basically the pandemic came in three waves. The second wave clearly being the most deadly. And we do have some evidence that the first wave, which was relatively mild and occurred in the spring of 1918, did give some immunity to those who received it when the second wave hit. In other words, there were variants here and the, the really big one occurred in the fall, the fall of 1918. Now, one of the good things to come out of this pandemic is, is we began to look at this particular <clears throat> pandemic. When I was in college um, and, and, and I asked students today who were in, in high school, do you study this epidemic? And the answer is we may learn a sentence about it. It's really been consumed by World War I. It happened during World War I, students learn all about uh, everything that happened during the war, the Red Scare, afterwards the Treaty of Versailles, but in fact, a pandemic that killed 10 times more Americans in this time that were killed on the battlefield is basically ignored. Um, what do we know about this particular pandemic? Um, one of the things that is interesting is that the key group, in other words, those who were most um, vulnerable to this particular virus were not the old, or the young, they were people between the ages of about 18 to 40. Now, it had first been believed that this was because many of them were soldiers who were um, packed together in army camps and then sent on uh, transport ships and were in awful conditions in the trenches of World War I. But in fact, what we have learned is that women in the United States ages 18 to 40, basically got it at the same rate. Um, men who did not go into the service got it at the same rate. And what we are learning and people are talking of various theories and, and the most, I think the most accepted theory is what is called cytokine storm, which you know about uh, quite well. And that, and that is simply that uh, when uh, a viral invader uh, enters the body and it has never been seen before, those with stronger immune systems put up a much greater fight. And in this particular case, um, the immune systems of 18 to 40 year olds, when you looked at their lungs, um, you saw incredible amounts of dead cells, flots of mucus. Uh, they were basically drowning in their own liquids. And we know now that bacterial pneumonia, not the virus itself, was the leading killer in 1918. Next slide, please. This is a slide I would recommend to you um, if you are teaching about the great pandemic of 1918-1919. The lead author is Dr. Howard Markle from the University of Michigan. And what Markle and others did was to study 43 cities during this pandemic to see what their mortality rates were. And what Markle showed was that non-pharmaceutical interventions played a very important role. In other words, there were no antibiotics, there was no vaccine, but <clears throat> cities that relied on things like crowd control, school and business closings, quarantines, um, staggered working hours, did much better than cities that did not. And what Markle found was that the earlier, the earlier a city began these interventions, the basically the firmer it was in making certain that crowd control and quarantine basically were enforced 
And the longer they kept the lid on, those were the cities who had the lowest mortality rates. In other words, <clears throat> non-pharmaceutical interventions actually worked. Um, I think that it's something, a lesson that we probably relearned um, in the current pandemic, but it's also one that has caused just such enormous controversy and anger um, within the American public, even though uh, public health officials like Markle have really, I think, shown the importance of these particular interventions. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> this is a slide, 1947, New York City. And these are people lining up to get the smallpox vaccine. One of the reasons I, I show it to you is that it really tells you something about the culture at that time, a sense of community, and I think a more <clears throat> realistic sense of the danger of certain um, diseases. Here is a case where a single tourist, an American citizen who visited Mexico, got off a bus in New York City, wasn't feeling well, uh, went to a hotel, went out to a couple of shows, went out to eat, went back to his hotel room, had a raging fever, um, and obviously the markings of smallpox, they sent him to Bellevue and then to um, an infectious disease hospital, and he died shortly thereafter of smallpox. In the meantime, a very small handful of people who had had something to do with him during this time period also came down with smallpox. The numbers were infinitesimally small, I think fewer than a dozen. Uh, one or two of them did die. And what the public health commissioner in New York City did was to request and urge, but not mandate uh, a va the vaccine, the smallpox vaccine for all New Yorkers. And what is quite remarkable is that in a period of less than one month, six million New Yorkers lined up and were vaccinated. Many of them had been vaccinated before, but it's very possible, you know, that it was a long time ago and um, uh, the, va the vaccine had waned or it hadn't worked or whatever it was, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated lined up for revaccinations or vaccinations in overwhelming numbers so that in a month's time, virtually the entire city was vaccinated against smallpox and there was not another case. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Many of you will recognize um, Albert Sabin in the top left and Jonas Salk um, in the bottom left. And Sabin, of course, came out later with his live virus uh, polio vaccine is attenuated polio vaccine and Jonas Salk came out in 1954 with his killed virus inactivated injected vaccine. Um, this was all done voluntarily through the March of Dimes. The government played virtually no role in this. And what I tried to show in the book I wrote uh, among other things was that this particular polio quote unquote crusade was important in so many ways. It revolutionized philanthropy, for example. Up until this point, if a philanthropy existed, it basically was something for um, a home for, the, for unwed mothers or orphans. And they would get one or two big donors who would basically finance the other thing. What the March of Dimes did was to use Madison Avenue for the first time, and it was to go into, to actually advertise themselves. <clears throat> and the key component was that we don't want big donations from a few, 
we want millions of donations from everyone in society. No one was too poor to give a dime to help a child walk again. And this of course was an insidious and very visual disease. Um, the March of Dimes was the first group to use celebrities, Elvis and Marilyn Monroe and the like. They were the first to use poster children, usually a little kid throwing down his crutches and walking into the sunlight the saying, with your dime, I have learned to walk again. Um, you would have all kinds of marches like what Susan Komen does, did today. This was the playbook. And what the March of Dimes did between 1945 and 1955 was to raise more money than every charity combined in the United States with the exception of the American Red Cross. They were just a, a behemoth when it came to raising money. And they promised that they would take care of every polio survivor. They promised they would give a vaccine to the American people. And they basically made good on those promises. The other thing they did <clears throat> was in some ways they really helped revolutionize modern medical research. At this time, big pharma and government were playing a very, very small role. And the March of Dimes used about 20% of the hundreds of millions of dollars it raised to find the best uh, infectious disease people in the country and to put them to work on a vaccine. Um, among things that they did, uh, which I thought were really interesting, was that they didn't care about uh, whether there were women scientists involved, whether there were Jewish scientists involved, whether it was Harvard and Yale. Um, basically, they wanted people who would follow the program. So uh, two of the biggest breakthroughs in the polio vaccine came from female scientists, which was very, very rare at this time. Dorothy Horseman at Yale figured out how, poli how the polio virus traveled through the body. The belief would have been that it went through the nose into the brain, into the central nervous system, and therefore a vaccine would not work because it had to work in the bloodstream. Horseman showed that actually it went through the mouth into the gut and usually was excreted out. But in a certain rare number of cases, it did travel through the bloodstream into the central nervous system. And therefore the battle could occur in the bloodstream and a vaccine could work. <clears throat> the other, um, someone says salt did not pass. I will. Uh, Yes. So we, I will talk about that later, I promise, okay? Um, the other thing was indirect costs. And um, sometimes when I talk about that, people's eyes glaze over. But what the March of Dimes did was to decide that indirect costs would have to be part of the package for these researchers. A researcher um, named John Enders, uh, who would win the Nobel Prize, um, was given $50,000 in the early 1940s by the March of Dimes, but Harvard, his employer turned it down. And when the March of Dimes said why, Harvard explained, well, it's nice you're giving Dr. Anders $50,000, but who's gonna pay for the lighting? Who's gonna pay to heat the lab? Who's gonna pay for the security, for the monkeys, for the Bunsen burners? We just don't have the money. And what the March of Dimes did was basically to pay for these indirect costs along with the grant. And that really is the lubricant by which research began to be done in uh, university and nonprofit settings. So they were really extraordinary. And the one other person I'd wanna talk about very briefly is a, a woman named Isabel Morgan. Isabel Morgan had been a researcher at the Rockefeller Institute but she was given a very small lab 
uh, very little chance of promotion, not much money because she was a woman. And she took a job at Johns Hopkins, which basically was working heavily on polio and saw her as a major contributor. In the late 1940s, Isabel Morgan, by my estimation, was about a year and a half ahead of Jonas Salk in the race for an inactivated polio vaccine. And at the very height of her research, Dr. Morgan made the decision that women had to make in those days and to some degree still have to worry about today. She decided to get married, to raise a family, and she left polio research forever. Would we now be talking about the Morgan vaccine if she had stayed the course? It's possible. There were other issues involved, but it's possible. But I think there is no doubt that she blazed the path that Jonas Salk took to completion. Finally, uh, regarding the polio vaccine, you know that Dr. Salk and the March of Dimes were involved in the largest public health experiment in American history. Um, more than 2 million children were lined up in a double blind study for a vaccine. No one was absolutely certain whether it worked, how safe it was, but parents were actually pushing their children into line because they obviously believed that the risks of the disease far outweighed the risks of the vaccine. My parents were among those. They really had a sense of what polio did every single year. They saw it and to them, a vaccine was a godsend and they were polio vol volunteers. They had worked to raise money like millions of other parents and they wanted to see this fruition. One final point, ironically, Jonas Salk was opposed to a double blind study. He believed that rather than giving half the kids a vaccine and half the kids a lookalike placebo, it was unconscionable in the middle of polio season to give anyone a placebo because he knew his vaccine worked. But basically they told him he had to pass scientific muster and he backed down. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just the Cutter incident. The reason I bring it up is that, as some of you may know, right after Jonas Salk's vaccine was declared safe and potent and effective, there was a rush, an absolutely rush to get it out to the public. There was almost no government oversight. Um, vaccine makers were just given Salk's formula and they're pretty much on their own. And one of the companies, Cutter uh, Vaccines of Berkeley, California, began um, basically manufacturing a vaccine and distributing it in the American West, and it was loaded with virulent live polio virus. The reason I bring it up is that it was people from the CDC in Atlanta, um, the, from the very newly created Epidemic Intelligence Service, who went out and found exactly what the problem was, and Cutter was immediately taken off the market. In the end, you know, about 70,000 kids came down with serious muscle weakness. Um, several hundred were permanently paralyzed and 10 died. What is interesting, however, is that even after Cutter, when the other vaccines basically were put back on the market. Everything had been stopped during this period. Parents lined up again to take the vaccine. This was the height, the very height of faith in science and medicine. Next slide, please. Okay, I've got to move forward very quickly. Um, this is a debate. Uh, this is the Republican presidential debates for the 2016 nomination. And I just wanna show you a very, very quick clip. Um, Rand Paul is also in this clip, uh, is also in the larger clip. This may be a shorter version, but let's show it and, and we can talk about it very briefly. <laughs> 
Go ahead, thanks. Vaccines was blamed for a measles outbreak here in California. <clears throat> Dr. Carson, Donald Trump has publicly and repeatedly linked vaccines, childhood vaccines, to autism, which, as you know, the medical community adamantly disputes. You're a pediatric neurosurgeon. Should Mr. Trump stop saying this? Well, let me put it this way. There, has been, there have been numerous studies, and they have not demonstrated uh, that there's any correlation between vaccinations and autism. Uh, this was something that was uh, spread widely 15 or 20 years ago, and it has not been adequately uh, you know, reveal to the public what's actually going on. Vaccines are very important, certain ones, the ones that would prevent death or crippling. There are others, there are multitudes of vaccines which probably don't fit in that category and there should be some discretion in those cases. But, you know, a lot of this is, is, is pushed by big government. And I think that's one of the things that people so vehemently uh, want to get rid of big government. You know, we have 4.1 million federal employees, 650 federal agencies and departments. That's why they have to take so much of our taxes. Should he stop saying it? Should he stop saying the vaccines cause autism? Well, you know, I've just explained it to him. Uh, he can read about it if he wants to. I think he's an intelligent man and will make the correct decision after getting the real facts. Mr. Trump, as president, well, I, you would I'd like to, I'd like I'm to going respond. right to you. I'd like Mr. To Trump, as president, you would be in charge of the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes of Health, both of which say you are wrong. How would you handle this as president? Autism has become an epidemic. 25 years ago, 35 years ago, you look at the statistics, not even close. It has gotten totally out of control. I am totally in favor of vaccines, but I want smaller doses over a longer period of time. Because you take a baby in, and I've seen it, and I've seen it, and I had my children taken care of over a long period of time, over a two or three year period of time, same exact amount. But you take this little beautiful baby and you pump, I mean, it looks just like it's meant for a horse, not for a child. And we've had so many instances, people that worked for me just the other day, Two years old, two and a half years old, a child, a beautiful child, went to have the vaccine and came back and a week later got a tremendous fever, got very, very sick, now is autistic. I only say it's not, I'm in favor of vaccines. Do them over a longer period of time, same amount. Thank but you. Just in, in little sections. Dr. Car I Dr. Think, Carson. And I think you're going to have, I think you're going to see a big impact on autism. Dr. Carson, you just heard his medical take. <laughs> He's an okay doctor. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, we have extremely well documented proof that there's no autism associated with vaccinations. But it is true that we are probably giving way too many in too short a period of time. And a lot of pediatricians now recognize that. And I think are cutting down on the number and the proximity in which those are done. And, and that's, I think all, that's, I'm saying, Jake, that's all I'm saying, Jake. That's all I'm saying. Dr. Paul, I'd like to bring you in. <laughs> A second opinion. <laughs> <laughs> one of the greatest, one of the greatest medical discoveries of all times were, were the vaccines, particularly for smallpox. And if you want to read a story, it's called The Speckled Monster. It's an amazing story. It was all done voluntarily, but people came in by the droves. George Washington wouldn't let his wife visit until she got vaccinated. So I'm all for vaccines, but I'm also for freedom. I'm also a little concerned about how they're bunched up. My kids had all of their vaccines, and even if the science doesn't say bunching them up's a problem, I ought to have the right to spread my vaccines out a little bit at the very least. All right, thank you so much. Coming up. Jake. I'm sorry, I, Governor Huckabee, please. I think we need to remember that there are... Maybe Kimberly, you can cut that off. Thanks. And go, go to the next slide. Uh, Kimberly, can, yeah, thank you. Um, what I want to do now, I just have a, you know, not much time left. Is one of the, you know, I'm, I'm writing on a number of issues at the moment, and one of the issues is 
and I, I would welcome uh, any comments or emails afterwards, is how much credit um, we give Trump, uh, President, former President Trump for Operation Warp Speed. Um, it was, there's no other word for it, it was a medical miracle. Um, and basically uh, you're talking about a man who was talking about autism in, uh, in, in this case, who seems to be, in other words, um, is become uh, the leading figure behind Operation Warp Speed. And we even see today, uh, there's sort of a battle going on between Governor DeSantis and President Trump, in which Trump is calling DeSantis gutless for not saying whether or not he got a booster. And DeSantis is criticizing Trump for overreach when Trump was president in terms of closing down certain industries and, uh, and, and the like. So in a way, Trump is walking this very, very fine line where he is being sort of outmaneuvered by someone on his right on issues involving vaccination. Um, one of the things I would say, again, very, very briefly, is that once Trump became president, uh, there was a noticeable change. At the very beginning, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., you know, the vaccine conspiracist came to see him at Trump Tower and Kennedy came down and made the announcement that Trump had asked him to chair a committee on vaccine safety. <clears throat> and obviously, Trump's advisors told him this was a very, very bad idea. And you never heard anything about it again to the point where Robert F. Kennedy Jr. recently condemned Trump for basically ignoring him. Uh, Trump, although it's not mandated, uh, it's voluntary uh, and traditional, Trump got a flu shot every single year, although he probably didn't believe in it, but he got it basically, I think, to set a standard. Also, when the great, uh, a number of very serious measles outbreaks occurred uh, between 2018 and 2019, um, Trump went on television um, urging parents to vaccinate their children uh, to take the measles vaccine at a time when many anti-vax people were saying the opposite. So, when he went with Operation Warp Speed, it wasn't this anti-vaxxer completely changing. It was sort of an evolution that occurred during his presidency that has really not been written about. And I think it, it would be very interesting to go through, uh, which I am sort of every aspect of Operation Warp Speed, <clears throat> and to see where Trump stood, how influential he was, and the like. Um, it, I, I think it should be an, an interesting journey. It's obvious that Operation Warp Speed wanted to get going. Speed meant everything. And it had to, I won't say it didn't cut any corners safety-wise, but it took a very reluctant pharma industry and made it possible for that industry to Operation Warp Speed did, to, to, along with mRNA and, and uh, other revolutionary technology to turn out vaccines in an eight month period. And you can see here, the ones I'll talk about are Pfizer and Moderna, the two most successful ones. Um, Pfizer's contract uh, for vaccine sales through the government um, in advanced purchase agreements was about 6 billion and actually went higher. Moderna, as you can see, was about for 5 billion, but Moderna also got close to a billion dollars in research development, amping up manufacturing and the like. In other words, Pfizer did all of its own research development and manufacturing. Um, Moderna did not. Moderna basically took Operation Warp Speed money from beginning to end. There was no risk for Moderna because if it failed, it still had not spent any of its own money on the process. Um, and I think that is, that, that is um, 
interesting in how the two went about it, Pfizer being the only company not to take research development or manufacturing money from the US government. All right, next slide, please. Okay, this is Pfizer's intellectual property agreement. Now, most of these contracts are, ex they're heavily redacted and I'll show you that next time. But here is one page from the Pfizer contract. And what I think is interesting is that when you look down just, um, can, I, I, can we go any further down on this? Or is this as, uh, I guess this may be as far as we go. Okay. Um, in this uh, contract, uh, the government recognized that all data relating to the vaccine um, had been generated by Pfizer and its collaboration partner, BioNTech, without the use of government funding. It was very important for Pfizer to put it in there because then it could take, it could play hardball and take a much harder position on patents, um, uh, intellectual property, uh, secrets, and the like. Uh, what is also interesting though, is um, this particular uh, clause at the very bottom where it says the government acknowledges that the Birch, that the Bayh-Dole Act does not apply to or govern this agreement, um, given that the government will not fund the conception or reduction of practice, et cetera. The agreement will basically will not give the government march in rights as term defined. And what marching rights really mean is that if the company fails to uh, produce a federally funded project, um, it must be available to the public on reasonable terms. And what Pfizer was truly concerned about was the pricing of this vaccine. In other words, there were a number of Democratic presidential candidates in 2020 who believed that the Bayh-Dole Act should be used to rein in the profits of uh, these particular companies. And the way to do it was to use march-in rights that the government has um, under Bayh-Dole. Um, what I think is also interesting in this particular case is that um, the vaccines uh, have never been until Operation Warp Speed, what you would call extremely profitable with certain exceptions. Only one in 10 vaccine projects make it from the laboratory to the local pharmacy and the average cost to the company is about a billion dollars. Expensive to develop, likely to fail, they pale in comparison to the statins and antidepressants that are taken every day as opposed to two or three times in one's life. Um, until 2020, Pfizer averaged about $6 billion annually in vaccine sales, its biggest seller being Prevnar. In 2021 and 2022, Pfizer expects to make over $40 billion on its COVID vaccine. And it will make it the largest revenue producer in the pharmaceutical industry, passing Johnson & Johnson. Until 1920, I'm sorry, until 2020, Moderna did not have a single licensed product on the market. Its vaccine sales for 2021 and 2022 are expected to exceed $25 billion. We know now that both Pfizer and <clears throat> Moderna are playing hardball regarding their patents. Um, they uh, basically are opposed to anything that will um, allow their recipe for these vaccines to be used by others. And what we're, we're talking about now um, 
is, is really a future um, where vaccine pricing and global distribution um, may be in the hands of pharmaceutical companies um, to a greater degree with these particular contracts than they have ever been before. Let me end now uh, talking about very briefly one of the chats that came up. And it was the chat involving um, Jonas Salk. In 1955, just after Salk's vaccine was found to be potent, safe, and effective, Salk was interviewed by the journalist Edward R. Murrow. Murrow said to Salk, who owns the patent on this vaccine? Well, the people, I would say, Salk replied, there is no patent. Can you patent the sun? And this statement, this elegant statement, which reflects the better angels of medical science, has become the rallying cry now in the high stakes battle over the ownership of COVID vaccines. What I will say, however, is that there's a history here and it's worth a look, starting with Salk himself. While it's true that there is no patent on the original polio vaccine, it wasn't for lack of trying. Both the March of Dimes, which sponsored Salk's research, and the University of Pittsburgh, where he worked, had seriously pushed the idea of a patent. What stopped them, as Salk privately admitted, was that, quote, much of what he had done was based on prior work by others. This is not to denigrate Salk, a superb scientist with a strong humanistic bent. It is rather to highlight his assessment that his vaccine could not have succeeded without the building blocks provided by other researchers, not to mention the fundraising efforts of the American people. And these are the same issues we face today. Uh, I, I think Walt Orenstein is here and Walt can talk about the, the, the terrible battle that is going on now between Moderna and um, NIH scientists over patent rights, um, which Moderna refuses to share. And what I will say simply in closing, is that these are issues that are really going to define vaccine development in the future. And they are issues that are well worth studying and considering. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, that was fantastic. I've been fielding several texts from uh, many people um, really, really enjoying the stories and the insights that you've uh, given. Um, and I see Dr. Ray has put applause in the chat. Um, I wanted to uh, back up and uh, ask a question here that uh, uh, Michael Chung put in the uh, chat. Um, uh, looking back at the polio experience and wondering if there was the same level of acceptance of the polio vaccine in African-American communities at the time and were organizations like March of Dimes thinking about underrepresented communities? Was that um, uh, part of the mission? Um, that, that's a, a very good question. Um, the one thing I will say uh, in terms of the vaccine rollout uh, for the March of Dimes, the March of Dimes did not um, basically criticize or make a big deal of the fact that the vaccine was going to be given to black children in a segregated church and white children in a segregated public school. You know, they made it very clear, we are not here to change the social mores of society. We are here to give as many children the polio vaccine as possible. And the evidence is very, very strong that uh, polio shots were given everywhere. Uh, they were not hoarded um, in, uh, uh, wealthy areas, uh, they were given in poor areas, as far as I can tell, um, in the same amounts and same percentages as they were given everywhere else. 
That's, that's amazing. Dr. Stevens, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Dr. Stevens is our chair. Uh, first, David, I want to thank you for your presentation. I uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, brings back uh, a lot of uh, a lot of memories over the years in terms of our journey with vaccines. But um, I want to go back to your opening remarks about mandates and about the Supreme Court decision, and just get your your comments. Obviously, the Supreme Court did uphold the health care yes. mandate, and wanted to see what your thoughts were about where we are headed with mandates in the future. Yeah, um, you know, I, that that is right now the $64 question. There really was a split on the court. But what is, what is quite interesting, uh, David, is that um, there were four dissenters on the decision to uh, make it mandatory for healthcare workers. It was a really close call. You figured that would be something they might find some agreement on and it did not happen. So the change of a single vote there um, could really uh, uh, be change, change the entire dynamic. Um, at the moment, uh, the cases that, that have come up through the federal courts, but have not uh, been adjudicated at the Supreme Court and may not be. For example, a number of uh, students at Indiana University in Bloomington um, opposed the fact that the university was telling them they had to be vaccinated. Um, and they said that it basically went against their, you know, their rights and, and the like. And the court ruled that Indiana University was well within its province um, in, in terms of public health to basically mandate this. And what, and what the, uh, the court basically said was, look, the students, you have a right not to take the vaccine, but they have a right not to accept you into the university. Um, my gut feeling is we are going to have to see how many private companies with more than 100 employees do keep mandates or produce mandates. I think that will be the watershed moment. They still have the right to do it if they want to. I think United Airlines, Tyson Foods, some of them have been pretty strong. Tyson, both, both of them had huge numbers of workers who tested positive for COVID and many who got quite sick. I think that's where the rubber is gonna meet the road at the moment on how many companies decide that yes, we will keep the mandate or just, uh, you know, find that it's, it's, just, it's just too difficult. It's not going to work. And I do have a sense that um, in 2022, uh, this issue is going to be really on the table politically. And we'll see how it works out. And I'm not confident it's going to work out in my favor. Thank you, and again, thank you for your for your comments. Thank you. We have um, more questions than that we will have time to ask, um, but uh, I wanted to ask you um, again, sort of a, a comparison or a look at polio versus COVID. How much of a role do you? Is it all politics, and is it all you know other factors, or how much of a role you know uh, was the visual impact of polio, um, and then the longer term risks of polio? How much of an effect did that have on vaccine uptake? That is different than um, in COVID, um, yeah. and uh, and uh, and how about the disproportionate impact on vulnerable and marginalized populations? Um, yeah, I, I, I think you know that that's a uh, an interesting point. Um, I think you've mentioned a number of reasons why uh, it was easier in that particular time. Um, it was also a children's disease, Wendy, unlike this one. I'm trying to think of a more vulnerable population, a population that needs the most protection, right? And kids fit in there very, very well. I also think, although I didn't go into it in any great degree, this was a time when antibiotics, penicillin, streptomycin and the like were rolling off the assembly lines, when vaccines were really coming into uh, you know, in other words, like the polio vaccine uh, were extremely popular. Um, 
to the point where if you would look at medical journals in the 1950s at about the time of the salt vaccine, you will see articles where medical students are being encouraged not to go into infectious disease, but to go into more chronic diseases because we have a handle on infectious disease now. And when you look at the arrogance of that after AIDS and Ebola and Zika and Legionnaires and Marburg and SARS and MERS and COVID, um, how incredibly off base we were, but you're talking, Wendy, about a time when Americans just had enormous faith in their family doctor and in the potential of medical science. And that is just not here today at all. Yeah, and so just to sort of close out in our last minute, um, you know, I, I, I you know, um, do, um, I have read a lot of the you know, old treatises where there certainly has always been an anti-vax population and certainly there were the anti-maskers in the um, uh, flu pandemic. Um, but how did we get to, you know, are there lessons or how did we get to this place with a really a greater hold of anti-science? I, I would have to come back um, for another full hour to talk about uh, the rise of the anti-vaccine movement. I, I, I will say that if you had asked a public health official 10 years ago, uh, what would kill the anti-vaccine movement, that person would say a pandemic. And in fact, the reverse has occurred. Um, I would have to think more about that. Uh, if I were to think in sort of historical terms, Again, very briefly, I would say two things did happen. Um, one was, I think that Watergate and the Vietnam War and events like that really um, took a toll on people's faith in experts and expertise and what they were being told. And I think the growth of the internet um, where you can find anything if you have a prejudice, it's there, and it's generally packaged in such a way that they have footnotes and you know all kinds of alleged medical quotes and the like. You can really be your own expert. I think in some ways it's very good to question the medical community, but it has really reached a level now. Um, I don't know how many of you are pediatricians, but I know at NYU Langone, I mean, that what, what, they're pulling their hair out at people who are coming in, parents who are coming in and say they want their vaccine spaced out. Um, and, and, and it's a matter of, do you wanna keep this patient or do you not? Um, these are such important issues. Or if you're, you know, we have some pediatricians, do you want an unvaccinated child in your waiting room? Um, you know, will you accept that child as a patient or will you give that person that the parent, the name of five other people in Manhattan who will treat an unvaccinated child? That may work in Manhattan, but what if you're in Gillette, Wyoming, where the nearest pediatrician is 100 miles away? You know, these are issues, incredibly important issues that we are going to have to deal with um, in the future. And this is not going away. This is not going away. I guess on that note, which is a kind of little bit of a somber one. Yeah, uh, I wish I could have ended on a higher note. <laughs> <laughs> I will um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you, you, you may get an opportunity to uh, have that uh, get, take us further along some of these conversations. But, um, but thank you so much for your time today. OK, um, Wendy, uh, one, one final thing. Um, anyone who would like to email me, uh, if you could put my email up, uh, send it out, uh, I'll be happy to get into a, uh, into a conversation. Thank you. That's incredibly kind. And I will drop that into Good. the chat. Thank you. Right. Thank you.